Velkommen her til Kulturcenter København. Dejligt at se jer. Nogle af jer var her i går, og så er der nogle nye ansigter også. Så det er godt at se, at de er kommet hertil. Det her det er jo det andet møde i en serie på fire. Og øhm, det handler om den her kamp, der foregår bag ved kulisserne, som øh, mange stiller spørgsmål om i dag. Men hvad sker der egentlig i verden? Og øh, dem, der var her i går, fik øh, et indtryk af, at man, Bibelen har faktisk et godt svar på, hvad det foregår bag ved kulisserne. Og øh, det skal vi prøve at kigge nærmere på i dag. Øh, og øh, som i går, så ville det være en øh, foredragsholder, der hedder Daniel Pell. Og ganske kort om Daniel til dem, der er nye her i aften. Så er Daniel øh, oprindelig fra New Zealand, født i New Zealand af hollandske forældre men bor nu i Norge og taler jo et øh, flydende norsk. Så øh, Daniel, han øh, har igennem mange år rejst rundt i øh, stor del af verden og holdt foredrag om, om de her temaer, om hvad der foregår bag ved kulisserne og, og givet svar på noget af det, som Bibelen fortæller. Og øh, vi er rigtig glade for at kunne have ham her i København, øh, at han kan, kan dele af sin viden her øh, i de her øh, emner. Som sagt, så er det øh, det andet, møde i uh, den her møderække, og vi fortsætter igen i, i morgen, uh, kl. 19 også, og uh, også på søndag. Og uh, jeg tænker egentlig bare, at det er uh, på tide at give tiden til dagen. Jeg kan lige nævne for jer, hvis der er nogen af det kunne tænke, at jeg har oversættelse til dansk, som endnu ikke har fået nogle headsets derude, så er det muligt, uh, fordi Dan kommer til at tale på engelsk. Så uh, hvis I vil have headsets, så kan I gå ud og finde dem derude, og det er også muligt at tage det på sin app på telefonen. Godt. Jamen, Daniel, velkommen herop. Thank you. All right. Good evening, everyone. Great to see you, and welcome back to our second presentation in our series, The Battle, A Look Behind the Scenes. And yesterday, we started on this journey together, and we talked about the great controversy, the battle between good and evil. And um, it was an exciting journey, and tonight we're going to continue together as we look at the subject, the unmasking of religious power play. I introduced yesterday uh, the book of Daniel, which is in the Old Testament, and the book of Revelation in the New Testament as twin books, twin prophetic books. And we're going to actually go tonight to some passages, both in the Old Testament book of Daniel and the New Testament book of Revelation. So I look forward to this presentation. Um, I hope you are tuned in, uh, that your mind is clear and your heart is open for God's Word. And as we began yesterday, I would like to begin again today with a short word of prayer, because I'm aware that um, Jesus said, some of the last things He said is that He would give the Holy Spirit to those who would ask for Him. And I always am aware that we need the guidance of God's Spirit when we open His Word, that the same Spirit that inspired the Scripture may be the same Spirit that instructs the Scripture to us. So let's have a short word of prayer, and then we'll get right into our subject for tonight. Heavenly Father, thank You so much that we can be gathered here on this Friday evening. Uh, I can't think of any uh, better thing to do on such an evening than to dive into your word. And we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will be present to illuminate our minds, touch our hearts, inspire us to come closer to you and to experience more of you. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's see if this clicker works. Yes, it does. I want to start with a quote by Sam Pascal. And uh, he said the following. Christianity started out in Palestine as a fellowship. It moved to Greece and became a philosophy. It moved to Italy and became an institution. It moved to Europe and became a culture. It moved to America and became an enterprise. I think there's a lot of truth to that statement that Christianity has taken a journey over the last 2,000 years, and during this journey over the last 2,000 years, it has significantly changed. It's not the same that it once was. Uh, Jesus started out by teaching and preaching and healing, and He called 12 disciples and trained them and then sent them out to do the same that He was doing. 
And it was based on a fellowship, an authentic fellowship of like-minded men and women, young and old, that believed in the incredible news, the good news of the gospel that Jesus had come into the world to proclaim and announce. They believed it and therefore they followed him. And so it started out as this wonderful fellowship of like-minded believers rooted and grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But then over time, it has changed significantly. Uh, for some, if you would ask what Christianity really is today, for some it is indeed more of a philosophy. For others, it is really something just traditional, uh, something that they do because their parents did it and their grandparents were involved in some church activities. For some, it might just be once a year, you know, being in church on Easter or Christmas. Uh, it's become something very cultural, and in other places of the world, it's even become a business. People are making big money on Christianity, so it has changed. And what we want to do tonight is we want to take away these layers, and we want to try to get back to the authentic message of Jesus. And what is so fascinating is that the Bible actually predicted some of the things that we are seeing in our world today. The Bible predicted that religion uh, would take a wrong turn that there would be significant changes that would come in. And so the Bible predicts this, and the Bible at the same time appeals for us to come back to the authentic teaching of Jesus. You maybe heard this quote before by Mahatma Gandhi that said, I like your Christ, I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. And some people are being put off from the whole thing of religion because they see people that don't really represent Jesus. And therefore, it's so important for us that are believers and followers of Jesus to give an authentic message, the very message that Jesus gave to his disciples, that we proclaim that very message, that we reveal to the world the light that is found in the character of and life and teachings of Jesus. So with that in mind, you know, um, we, can, we, we just see so many opinions around us in the world of people that have been exposed to religion, and some people will say, you know, I, I want nothing to do with religion because, uh, you know, I just can't, I can't just see God's love in a message that he would burn people in hell for eternity if they reject him. Uh, some people, for some people, that uh, closes the door, and, 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 and perhaps that's the case for you, or, or you've had significant challenges with that idea, then I do invite you to come back on our final, or not, uh, actually tomorrow already, in our tomorrow's presentation, we're going to deal with that subject of death, life, death, and the future, where we look at uh, some of the teachings of Scripture, and perhaps we'll be surprised as to what the teachers really, or what the Scripture really teaches about these things. Others, they will say, no, for me, God is love. Uh, others will say, well, religion just creates war, or, well, others will again say, God gives meaning and hope to my life. Uh, and someone else will say, well, God doesn't care. And if I would go on the streets here in Copenhagen and, and I would ask 10 different people uh, what their experience is with the Bible or experience with God, I might get 10 different answers. And I think much of this is based upon the perceptions that people have gotten from what they see in Christianity, uh, particularly in, Christ in, in cultural Christianity. And therefore, it is so exciting when we actually come with an open mind and we say, you know what? Okay, let's just place aside all this about culture and, and philosophies and, and all these kind of things, traditions, and all the things that have been accumulating over the last 2,000 years. What if we could just remove that and just come back to what, what does this book actually teach? What does this book actually say? What did Jesus actually say about his life and teachings. Well, we're going to take a journey in Bible prophecy, and um, as I said yesterday evening as well, I invite you to put on these prophetic glasses, so to speak, and to look at the world through Bible prophecy. And our journey is going to take us to the book of Daniel, which you find in the Old Testament. It was written between 500 and 600 years before Christ. Daniel was a Jew living in Jerusalem, and Jerusalem was attacked by King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the king of Babylon, and Daniel, among others, was taken captive, and he was taken to the city of Babylon. And it is while he was in captivity in Babylon that he wrote down this book that we call the book of Daniel that we find in, in the Old Testament. 
Now, in the book of Daniel, there are lots of dreams and visions and prophecies. Therefore, we call it an apocalyptic book. It is a book dealing with future events. And in one of the chapters in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, Daniel has a prophetic dream. And in this prophetic dream, what he sees is four beasts that are coming up out of the sea. Now, we don't have to start guessing what all of this means because I, I can tell you I've been enough into uh, preaching and teaching God's Word and traveling around the world to know that and, and reading many books about prophecy that I know that are many opinions about Bible prophecy. And where many people go wrong is that they look at the world first, they look at the world around them, and, and then they try to take the events of the world and make them fit in the Bible. This is what you actually, there's a technical term for this, it's eisegesis. It means that you try to put your own uh, concepts into the text. But rather than doing that, the better approach is the exegetical approach. That's just a technical term again, but it means getting what the Scripture says. So allowing the Scriptures to speak to us. And yes, if it fits with world events, well, interesting, but, but don't let yourself be carried away by some theories that you try to get into the Scriptures, but rather let the Scriptures speak, and then you can look at what is happening around you, and you'll see that there are fascinating connections. And, um, and so that's what we're going to try to do tonight as well, as we look at Daniel chapter 7, where Daniel the prophet has a prophetic dream, a vision, where he sees these four beasts coming up out of the sea. And we're not going to pass around the hat tonight, and everyone throws in their answer as to what the beasts represent, and then we shuffle the hat and we take out, and we, okay, then we have an answer. That's not how we're going to do it. Rather, we're just going to allow the Bible to explain for us what this means. So I hope you're ready for this journey. Now... Before I read about these beasts, take notice in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 17 and verse 23, it actually tells us already what the beasts represent. The beasts in, these chap in this chapter are representing kingdoms. It says very clearly, these, those great beasts which are four are four kings. The beast is a kingdom. So, Again, we don't have to guess. The Bible actually explains because there is an angel that is present there to, and speaks to Daniel and gives him the explanation of what these kingdoms mean They are, or what these beasts mean. They are representing kingdoms. Now, um, they came up out of the water. And when you go to the twin book of the book of Daniel, which is the book of Revelation, uh, you will find in chapter 17 and verse 15, very interestingly, an explanation as to what waters or sea represents in Bible prophecy. We are told that the waters are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Now, this is kind of, we have this even in our language, in, in, the, in the English language. We, we might say when we see a lot of people, we will say, oh, it was like a sea of people. Uh, and so these are symbols that are being used in Bible prophecy. And it's important for us to allow the Bible to interpret itself. And you will find that when you, when you study more and more the Bible, you will go from verse to verse, and then you will be able to compare, and um, the one verse will explain the other, just like, just like here. Now let's take a look at the first beast that Daniel sees. And the reason why we are looking at this particular prophecy is because it brings us through the different kingdoms from the time of Daniel, from the time of Babylon, and it leads us to the arrival of a false religious system. It leads us to the arrival of what some people would call the Antichrist power of Bible prophecy. And this Antichrist power was really the motor behind the decay and decline of Christianity. And so we're looking at different powers that are bringing us up to that moment. So we're starting with a little bit of history here, and I hope it's not too boring. I hope that you can hang in in this historic lesson because we, are, we do have a destination that we're going to arrive at. So uh, look at the description of the first beast that Daniel sees here in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 4. It says, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. We already found out that the beast represents a kingdom. Of course, the question then is, which kingdom are we here looking at? Well, 
You know what is fascinating? When you go to another prophet that lived almost at the same time of Daniel, shortly before, he actually tells us about the attack of the kingdom of Babylon on Jerusalem. This was the prophet Jeremiah. And Jeremiah describes the Babylonian attack in the following way in chapter 4. And if you look at verse 7 and 13, it says, The lion came up from his thicket, he says, and the destroyer of nations is on his way. And then a little bit later, he says in the same chapter, And his chariots are like a whirlwind, his horses are swifter than eagles. So when Jeremiah the prophet gives us an explanation of Babylon attacking, he describes Babylon like a lion and is swifter than eagles. Also, besides this biblical explanation, we also find that archaeologists that studied into ancient Babylon, guess what symbol Babylon was using again and again? The lion with the wings. And you will even find this on the famous Ishtar Gate, which was the entrance into Babylon. Uh, you can even find some of these discoveries um, in uh, the Museum of Berlin today when you go there. So, so I don't think we need to doubt here as to what the, bi what, what, what the lion represents with the wings. It's none other than the kingdom of Babylon. Now, here's also a very interesting like prophetic key. And that is the following. Prophecies often start where the prophet is. So Daniel is in Babylon. What's going to be the first revelation? Babylon. And then from there, he's going to be carried into the future. Later, when we get to the book of Revelation, John was living in the time of Rome, pagan Rome. Guess where many of the prophecies started? Pagan Rome. So very clear here what we're looking at. Well, this also corresponds to another prophecy that I just shortly introduced on our first night yesterday. We didn't really go into the depth of that prophecy, but it's found in Daniel chapter 2. And in Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, the king of Babylon. And he dreams about this, this image that is made up of different metals, and each metal represents also a kingdom. And the first metal in the image was the head of gold. And it represents Babylon. And so we find that Daniel chapter 7 is corresponding with Daniel chapter 2. And for those of you that have ever been, in, to any extent, uh, involved in education, whether it be that you're teaching in a school or, or that you're teaching a seminar or on the job that you're teaching a colleague or another person, you will know that in education there's this, there's this um, uh, principle that is in, in, extremely important, and that is that you, you teach something and then you repeat what you taught, but then you add a little bit more. And then when you take the next step, you teach again what, what, what you've covered, and then you add a little bit more. This is exactly what Bible prophecy does. Bible prophecy gives us that foundational prophecy in Daniel chapter 2, the dream of the metal man made of different, uh, different metals, and, and, and each metal is representing a kingdom leading from Babylon to the end of time when Jesus returns. And in Daniel chapter 7, Four beasts representing the same kingdoms and leading us also to the end of time. But there's more detail. And we're going to look a little bit of that detail uh, in our presentation tonight. So, very kingly creature, the lion, representing the kingly nation of Babylon. But that's not the end because we have a second beast that Daniel saw. And it is de described in verse 5. Now look at what it says. And suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear... It was raised up on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth, uh, ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and they said thus to it, Arise and devour much flesh. Now, of course, we can look historically. We have kind of the luxury in 2022 to be able to look back at history, and we see that the, the kingdom that conquered Babylon was none other than the Medo-Persian Empire. Uh, the Medo-Persian Empire, very interestingly, uh, conquered Babylon very quickly, but very unexpectedly. They had surrounded the city, and, and the Babylonians weren't afraid at all. I mean, the, their walls were, were so thick that you could race three chariots on top. They had a food supply of 20 years. They had a river, the river Euphrates, running through the city. They had enough water. They had enough food. Uh, there are even some that say that there are, there are records of them throwing food over the wall and just telling the Medo-Persians, here, you have a lunch package. Go home. You know, but the Medo-Persians didn't go home. They stayed. 
And, uh, and then you read, actually, this, there's an account in the book of Daniel, chapter 5, that describes how the city fell. And this corresponds with what I mentioned yesterday, the Cyrus Cylinder that you, can, that you can see in the British Museum today in London that describes how it happened. What happened was that King Belshazzar was having this massive feast, and at the same time, the Medo-Persians were outside. And what the Medo-Persians did under the commander of Cyrus is they, they made this huge reservoir and they led the water of the Euphrates into the reservoir and so they dried out the riverbed. And then they marched their men through the riverbed, under the wall and into the city and they conquered it in one night. So this is what happened, how Medo-Persia conquered Babylon. And it's represented here by this bear that was raised up on one side. Some will say that this is representing that the Medes and the Persians were a united empire. Um, and however, the, the, the Persians were stronger than the Medes. And then you have the three ribs. Could well represent the three nations that they destroyed, Babylon. And then there were two other nations that they also conquered. So there's some details here that are interesting when you look at some of the historic events that transpired. Well, we move on to our third beast here, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 6. It says, after this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. If you think about a lion, it's kind of like a kingly creature. A bear is a very strong animal. A leopard, you could say, is a fast animal, especially if you put four wings on its back. Um, and here we find a nation, a kingdom, that rapidly conquered the then known world, and it's none other than Greece. Now, Greece was led by Alexander the Great, and Alexander the Great was a, a very a genius when it came to military, uh, uh, using his military and using his army. When he faced off with the Medes and the Persians, he was heavily outnumbered. Uh, some historians will say one by 10, others will even say one by 20, but he was heavily outnumbered by the king, Darius, that was ruling over the Medes and the Persians at that time. Uh, but there is this account, which is kind of funny, how Darius, you know, he has much larger army, but he's afraid of Alexander the Great because he thinks, you know, there's something about that young guy. He was only in his late 20s when he was like conquering the world. And so he sends this messenger to Alexander the Great, and the message says, um, why can't you just be the king of the West and I'll be the king of the East? And then Alexander the Great sent a message back and says, just like there are new, no two suns in the sky, there is no place for you and I. And so the battle began, the famous battle of Arbella, and uh, uh, Alexander the Great was able to use his infantry and, and, and just his, his army in such a way that he completely uh, demolished the army of the Medes and the Persians, and he was able to conquer Babylon and, of course, uh, uh, the city of Babylon that the Medes and the Persians occupied, but then he further moved into India and conquered much of the then-known world in about a, a time span of about eight years on horseback. So this was the Greece Empire. When Alexander the Great died, his son was too young to take on the kingdom. And uh, so some say that, he, that his last words were something to the effect of, may the strongest win. He had four generals, which is kind of interesting with the four heads here in the, uh, in the beast. And these four generals then started fighting over the empire. And uh, that's basically how the Greece empire um, came to be. We're looking here at a time span of 331 to 168 BC. We're still before Christ here. But this was not the last animal that Daniel saw in this prophetic dream, this prophetic vision. And now we come to the fourth and last beast that he saw. He saw the lion, the bear, the leopard, and then he sees this beast that cannot even be likened unto anything in the animal kingdom. This is the description that we have in the Bible in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 7. It says... After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before, and it had ten horns. Take notice of that description, that phrase, it was different from all the beasts before. And, and we're moving here through the corridors of time, right? We're going from Babylon to Medo-Persia to Greece. And historically, when we look back, we know which, which kingdom came after or which significant kingdom came on the scene after uh, the breakup of Greece, and that is Rome, 
Rome, which is known as the Iron Monarchy of Rome. In Daniel chapter 2, it was represented by the, by the legs, the long legs of iron. And in Daniel chapter 7, it's represented here by the beast with iron teeth the beast of Rome. Now, this is kind of an interesting um, little, little thing I thought I would share with you tonight. Um, a couple of years ago, I was invited to speak uh, at a conference in Germany uh, in the city of Nuremberg. Maybe some of you have been there. And um, I actually was preaching on different prophetic themes, and, and uh, as I recall, I actually also preached on this topic of Daniel chapter 7. Uh, and then someone came to me afterwards and said, I have really something interesting to show you. And so they invited me uh, to the city center in Nuremberg. And in the city center of Nuremberg, there's this courthouse, this townhouse, town hall courthouse. And um, it has two inter- entrances from the road, the main road, where you, where, when you stand in front of it. And uh, he said, look at that. And, and I looked up. And uh, this, is, this is a picture of one of the entrances. And I don't know if you can see it. Uh, yeah, you see it pretty clearly here. Um, Look at this. You see in the back there a lion with wings, uh, and then you see a man that is like in, in the typical attire of a Babylonian, an ancient Babylonian. Uh, and on the other side, you have uh, a picture of um, a bear, and if you actually would, if I would zoom in that, to that picture, you would see that it has three ribs in its mouth, and uh, a, a sculpture of a man in the typical Medo-Persia attire. Uh, and this was one of the entrances, and then a couple of meters uh, away, you have the other entrance. And take notice of this. You have here the leopard with the four heads. And again, the typical attire of, the, of, of Greece, a Grecian uh, figure. And then you have here the beast with ten horns. And you have the Roman figure there, sculptured. So um, somehow someone had been studying Bible prophecy and put this together. <laughs> uh, very interesting that they were able to connect with the kingdoms there that we find in Daniel chapter 7. Now, concerning the fourth beast, it's very interesting what the Bible says about this fourth beast. It says in chapter 7 and verse 24, the ten horns, so remember it had ten horns on its head, the ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. So Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and then what will happen with Rome? Out of Rome will come ten kingdoms. Now, when you look at this historically, um, the Roman Empire, um, well, it, it had this great divide. And if you look at the Western Roman Empire and, and, you, look at the, and you focus on, on, on those regions, you will actually find uh, a division of ten kingdoms or nations coming out of the Western Roman Empire. And this is now where prof- prophecy is, is, is pushing us and causing us to focus on that particular region because what is coming next What we're going to get to now is the arrival of this counterfeit Christian power, so-called Christian power, that is going to lead Christianity into a a decline, um, into what we could call a deformation period. You know, the church was formed in the beginning. You have the formation of the church. Jesus chose his 12 disciples, sent them out. It was this fellowship of believers uh, centered in the life and teachings of Jesus. Uh, But then a couple of centuries into this story, there's like, this starts this decline, the deformation. What was formed is now deformed. That's why you needed eventually a reformation, (laughs) to reform, to get back to what the original actually was all about. Now take notice of what the Bible says about what happened next. Daniel's focus is now on that fourth beast. Uh, He's seen the ten horns, and then it says in verse 8, Daniel writes this, he says, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, it says a little one, coming up among them before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. So the the scene really takes on some interesting descriptions here where Daniel's focus is now on that little horn that has now come up, and it's pushing out three of the ten horns. Now, let's look at the characteristics of this little horn and just put them together, and then I'll first present the characteristics, and then you yourself can start thinking which power this could be. Um, Take notice that it arose among the ten horns. So whatever power we're identifying here, 
you know, we, we need to kind of leave out New Zealand and Australia and North America and South America, right? Because we're looking at here among the ten horns, so among the breakup or division, fragmentation of the Roman Empire, okay? So um, it arose after the ten horns. So after uh, pagan Rome had its period of the Caesars and all of that, as we're coming kind of to, to the end of the emperors of Rome and it's broken up, uh, then we should expect this power to, to come on the scene. Now, it says that it was different from the ten horns, and what we're going to find out as we look closer at the description is that it's not just a political power like the others, the political power of Babylon and Medo-Persia and Greece and Rome, but it's also a religious power that we're dealing with here. And why do I say that? Because of the very descriptions in Daniel 7. It talks about how he persecuted the saints of the Most High, God's people. He actually made war on God's people and also made religious laws. It says that he tried to change the very laws of God. Very, very interesting. Another clear characteristic here uh, is that he defeated three kingdoms. Remember, three horns were plucked out. So we're looking at a power that came up after the decline of the, Rome, uh, of, of the pagan Roman Empire. Uh, the division has taken place, and now there's this power that's coming up on the scene, and he actually made war on three tribes, three of these kingdoms, the Vandals, the Heruli, and the Ostrogoths. They were defeated by this power in order for him to gain political and religious power at this time. And uh, for some of you, you are already connecting the dots as to where this is heading. And history tells us, listen to this, to the succession of the Caesars came the succession of the pontiffs in Rome. When Constantine, which was a, uh, an, one of the emperors that became so-called Christian uh, in order to unite his empire, it says when Constantine left Rome, he gave his seat to the pontiff. Now, this is what we could call a transition from pagan Rome, the emperors of pagan Rome. You know, you have uh, Julius Caesar and Augustus and Tiberius and, and Nero and all of these, all of these, all the way to Constantine, really. And then we have a transition from pagan Rome to what we could call, or what we will call, papal Rome. This is the transition uh, that we are looking at here in history. Remember that the little horn is coming up out of the fourth beast. He's kind of part of the fourth beast. It's the next phase of the Roman Empire. And we go here to papal Rome. Constantine was the emperor that, well, what happened was just, this is kind of a big history lesson and I'll try to condense it to a couple of sentences here. Um, basically, Constantine was looking at his empire and there were lots of Christians and lots of pagans and, and there was lots of division and he thought, okay, how am I gonna unite my empire? You know what? I'll just profess Christianity, but in order to please the pagans, I'll just let them bring all of their paganism into Christianity and we'll just kind of baptize it Christian. So you get all of these pagan rites that then are brought right into the back door of the church under the legitimate rule of this, you know, uh, emperor, Constantine. And, uh, and so lots of these, lot, Christianity has now gone through a major shift, a major shift. You know, what, what, what he did, Constantine, among other things, is he said, he, he made his army march through a river, and then he said, you're all baptized. Now, where do you find that in the Bible? Tell me, which verse? <laughs> There's no verse in the Bible that, that, that says that that's how baptism should happen, right? Baptism is a personal choice between you and God. Can someone say amen? Okay. You know, and, and we don't baptize babies either, right? B people that have come to a certain age make their personal decision to be a follower of Jesus, and then they become part of the Christian body of believers. So what Constantine was doing is, is trying to unite his empire, but in the attempt to unite his empire, Christianity was literally watered down. Like, like the truth was now just encumbered with all of these traditions and pagan rites that were coming into the church. And uh, Constantine, what he also did is he wanted to focus more on the eastern part of his empire, and so he actually transferred his capital from Rome in Italy to Constantinople, which we now call Istanbul in Turkey, and, and, and then there was like a vacuum of power in Rome, and so you know what he did? He said, okay, I'll just give the power to the bishop of Rome. 
Now, in original, early on Christianity, there were like these bodies of believers, and they just simply had someone that would lead out in services or would lead out in, 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 in a study of the Word and, 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 and in ministry, and it was all very simple and without lots of titles and, 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 and such involved. But as you go throughout the centuries, the bishop, what they then started to call the bishops of these churches were getting more and more and more power. And, and, and what Constantine did was given them even more power than they had before. And what is this resulting in? Corruption. You know, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. John, John Acton said that, that, that famous quote, power tends to corrupt, right? And this is exactly what we see here in, in, in history. The popes filled the place of the vacant emperors of Rome, inheriting their power, their prestige, and titles from paganism. The papacy is but the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon its grave. This is from Stansley's history, and this is what we see take place. Um, Constantine, you know, the great, um, he um, was very, very uh, intent uh, about what he was doing here in giving the power to the bishops of Rome. This is actually a painting. It's called The Donation of Constantine. And I'm not sure if you can see it so clearly, but actually Constantine is kneeling before the Pope there and, and giving uh, his very uh, titles to this religious power. Uh, as I said before, it's like church history has these kind of chapters or ep epochs. And, and the fourth is really the formation of the church. Then you have the deformation of the church, where we're, what we're talking about right now. Uh, but eventually, you have the Reformation. And what was the Reformation all about? It was a call to come back to Scripture. Sola Scriptura, they said, the Bible only. You know, uh, they wanted to come back to what the Bible actually teaches. It's like they had been in this long, dark tunnel... And, and, and then some light was starting to shine. They were coming out of that tunnel, and, and, and they, they pointed people back to the Scriptures. Of course, it took time because there were so many traditions that had come into the church over a period of many hundreds of years, many centuries, and so it also took time for them to rediscover some of the teachings that had been lost. And that's why I often say that we are still in the Reformation today. Sometimes we look at the Reformation, we say, okay, that was a historic event. That happened in the days of Martin Luther in 1517. You know, he took his 95 thesis and he nailed it on the church door of Wittenberg uh, with his protest against the corruptions of Rome. And that was, yeah, somewhat the beginning of this movement, but I, I mean, there's still a lot for us to rediscover. There's still a lot for us to, to remove of this baggage that, 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 is, that has been heaped on Christianity over all of these centuries and over all of these years. Now, let me just say a statement here before we go any further here. What I'm not trying to do tonight here is to point fingers to any particular people. What we're doing is we are, we are exposing a system here. As a matter of fact, when you look at the papacy or the Roman Catholic Church here, um, I myself come from a Roman Catholic family. My parents were raised Roman Catholics, and I know that there are many loving Christians in the Roman Catholic Church. So what we're doing tonight is not pointing fingers and saying, okay, what we're doing is we're allowing the Bible itself to expose a corrupt system. And by doing so, what we, do, what we want to do is call people back into the light of the gospel. Amen? And so that's, uh, that's really our, our goal. Now, look at what it says here. This is actually a quote taken from uh, Catholic sources. It says, Seek where you will, through heaven and earth, and you will find but one created being who can forgive the sinner. Okay, well, I, I hope that's Jesus, because I don't know of any other <laughs> that can forgive sins. But look at how the quote continues. That extraordinary being is the, it doesn't say Jesus, is the priest, the Catholic priest. You see, the, the, the Roman Catholic system, what really took place in this period of, of the deformation, the decline and corrupt Christianity, is that it replaced the work of Jesus as our mediator between us and God and replaced it with a human being. And so you no longer go to Jesus with your sins directly for forgiveness, but you go through an earthly person. That is an attack on the very truth of, and teachings of Jesus, which invited us to come directly to him. It says the Pope, this is also from Catholic sources, it says the Pope, Bishop of Rome, is not only the representative of Jesus, 
Christ, Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself, hidden under the veil of the flesh. Does the Pope speak? It is Jesus Christ who speaks. You see, these are very, very heavy claims. Uh, claims that, that of, of, of authority and power that you will actually not find in the New Testament and in the teachings of Jesus. Uh, here another one. It says, the Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were, God and the vicar of God. Now, you might say tonight, yeah, I agree with that, and that, that's fine. I mean, we all, we talked about it yesterday, we all have freedom of decision. God has given us choice. So if some people say, I'm okay with that, well, then you're free to believe that. But, but if you want to say tonight, I want to go by the Bible, I want to go by the authentic teachings of Jesus, well, obviously you can't go along with that, right? The, the, this is not in harmony with what Jesus taught. Jesus was inviting us to experience the authentic salvation that he provided and offered through his death on the cross and through his resurrection, and he wants an intimate friendship with each and every one of us, and he invites us to come to him directly, not through any other human being. There is no human being that can really represent Jesus. Jesus must stand for himself, for the very one that he was and that he is. Here, another one taken, again, from Catholic sources. It says, we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. And this ties a little bit into the phrase antichrist because many people have talked about the antichrist, and uh, the word antichrist is made up of two words. It's made up of the word anti and Christ, and antichrist means, of course, in opposition to Christ. That's one meaning of the word. But there's a second meaning of the word. Antichrist, the word anti is also in place of. So when we say the Antichrist, it's, yes, a power that is opposed to the teachings of Jesus and the person of Jesus, but it's also a power that seeks to take the place of Jesus. And that is what Scripture is revealing here in prophecy. There would be an earthly power that would seek to take the very place of Jesus and introduce doctrines that were contrary to the teachings of of Jesus. And I hope you come back tomorrow night because tomorrow night what we're going to look at is this whole concept of life and death in the future. And one of the things, and I'm not going to give away too much, I'm kind of tempted to say, but I'll keep it for tomorrow, but I'll just say real shortly, one of the things that Rome did was they played on the people's superstitious fears about the afterlife. And so what they would do is they would start teaching that there was an eternal hell and uh, that there was also a place called purgatory. And if your case was not yet decided whether you would go to heaven or hell, you would be in purgatory. But guess what? There's a way to get out of purgatory. Pay the church. And so if you would come and you would just pay the church some money, then the priest would say this, like, uh, you know, this, this magical prayer, and, and, and your loved one would go from purgatory, burning in purgatory, into the bliss of heaven. Well, of course people were willing to pay. And, and, and entire structures within Rome, like St. Peter's Basilica, I visited, I walked in there. St. Peter's Basilica was built on the money that the church gathered in the Middle Ages by teaching this doctrine. And so we're not looking at just that kind, some kind of like, okay, you believe what you want and, and you believe what you want. No, these are serious matters because we have to go by what Jesus himself taught and not what some human structure has revealed about God. You see, the problem today is why do we have so many atheists? Why do we have so many people rejecting Christianity and religion? It is because they have been exposed to a false Christianity and religion that they have turned away from, but they have never been introduced to the person and character and beauty of Jesus. And so we have, we have a work to do, and, I, and I've taken upon myself as a very serious work that God has laid on my heart to do whatever I can to actually take this book and to present it and to allow this book to present the character of God as a God of love to allow it to present Jesus Christ in his authenticity. And then I believe the words of Jesus himself will come to pass because Jesus said this, when I be lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. I believe that. I believe a true, beautiful picture of the authentic Jesus will draw people to himself. But at the same time, I know that a false uh, a mischaracterization of Christianity will do the opposite. It will draw people away from Jesus. And that's why this is such an important topic that we're talking about tonight. 
Uh, I, I quoted this earlier, John Acton, he said, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So a, lot, a lot of people know this quote, but they don't know the setting in which it was spoken. It's kind of interesting. Uh, he was actually writing a letter to a friend, and they were at that time, the, the, the big debate within Europe was about the infallibility of the Pope. So when the Pope speaks, is everything that he speaks, is it just infallible or, or, or not? And, and in that connection, John, wrote, John Acton wrote to a friend and he says, you know what, power tends to corrupt. You know, th this human being <laughs> is given so much power that it corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. You know, what I'm presenting you tonight is not some kind of novel thing that, like, I only have found. No, not at all. Actually, if you go back and you read church history, you will find out that all, almost all of these reformers that we are familiar with, Wycliffe, Tyndale, Cranmer, John Bunyan, Isaac Newton, George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, Charles Spurgeon, they all taught from the Bible prophecies, from the prophecies of like Daniel 7 and other prophecies, that the Pope is the Antichrist, that this system of, the, of Rome is, 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 is not a true form of Christianity. Now, you won't hear that so much in our political correct world today. Uh, you, will, you, you won't hear that. But, but if you go a little bit into the history books, you'll find very clear teachings on this. Now, let's go back to Daniel 7 because there's something else just so beautiful and incredible that is happening here. Because now we've, we've looked at kind of exposing this power, but in contrast to this apostate power, we have this incredible, beautiful picture of Jesus here in Daniel chapter 7. And it says in verse 13 and 14, right after he's seen all the four beasts, he's seen the ten horns on the fourth beast, he's the little horn has come up, and we have a description of that little horn and what he does, and then we read the following. I was watching in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. And I mentioned this yesterday in the presentation, that the phrase Son of Man is a description that Jesus uses of himself. So when we read Son of Man in the Gospels, and it's more than in the Greek New Testaments, New Testaments were originally written in Greek, um, you will find more than 80 times that Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man. Where did he get that from? Daniel 7. There's no other place he got it from. I mean, there's no other place in the vol voluminous writings of the Old Testament where he got it from. He got it directly from this vision. So what Jesus, when he goes around, he says, the Son of Man, the Son of Man, the Son of Man. And referring to himself, he's actually hoping that the people will understand that what Daniel the prophet spoke about 500 years earlier, that's him, the Son of Man. Now, what would the Son of Man do? It says here he would come with the clouds of heaven. The, 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 the description continues. It says, he came to the Ancient of Days, which is none other than God himself, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, it says that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him, capital H, Jesus. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Now, I want you to catch the contrast here because we're looking at all these earthly kingdoms that had their time, you know, Babylon had its time, Medo-Persia had its time, Rome had its time, but, but now we're introduced to a kingdom that will never end. Christ's kingdom will be an eternal one, and it will be one that is not marked by corruption. It is one where every citizen is valued and loved by the infinite God that created them in his own image. You know, the phrase son of man is pointing to Jesus, and, and, and it appears 81 times in the, in the Greek New Testament Gospels, and I want to just introduce you to a couple of these instances in the Gospels where this phrase is used. Now, we're not going to go to all 81 tonight, but I just, I just made a little selection here for you to get an idea of how different the kingdom of Jesus is in contrast to all these other kingdoms. Now, look what it says. For example, in the book of Matthew, that's the first Gospel book, the first book in the New Testament, chapter 8 and verse 20, it says, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now think about that. Do you think that the king of Nebuchadnezzar had a place to rest his head? Yeah, probably. More than one place, probably. Several palaces. M mighty kingdom. What about Medo-Persia? What about Alexander the Great? Certainly, all of these, what about all the Caesars of Rome? They all were powerful beings that suppressed others in order to gain riches and influence. But Jesus, his kingdom is different. It's another type of kingdom. It's an upside-down kingdom. It's a kingdom where the Son of Man 
actually has nowhere to rest his head. Like the king of the universe that created everything so beautifully was willing to become one of us, took upon himself the flesh, flesh and blood of human beings, and, and he became a servant and uh, was even willing to die as a human being. This is so radically different than what we've seen up to this point. In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 6, it says, the Son of Man has power on earth. Now, if I just stop there, okay, the Son of Man has power. Okay, did, did, did the kingdom of Babylon have power? Oh, absolutely, they had power. Uh, did Medo-Persia have power? Oh, yeah, yeah, they had power. Medo uh, Greece had power. All of these kingdoms have had power, but what kind of power do they have? Well, they have power to tell you how much taxes to pay. They have power, you know, to, to, to banish you or to imprison you or whatever if you, if you, if you rebel. But the Son of Man has a different kind of power. What kind of power does he have? He has power to forgive sins. He can actually, why? Because he would take upon himself our sins and pay the price of our sins on the cross, and therefore, this is a power that he has to say, you're forgiven. There is no human being on the face of this planet that can forgive your sins. There is no historic figure, however rich they were or mighty they were, that can forgive your sins. This is a power that only Jesus has. Now let's, let's look at a couple of others here. Mark chapter 8 and verse 31. It says, listen to this, the Son of Man must suffer many things be killed, and after three days rise again. This is radical because what kind of king wants to suffer? I mean, kings are usually the last ones that suffer. There are others that have to suffer for them to make their life as comfortable as possible. But here there's a king that is willing to die for those that are part of his kingdom. Mark chapter 9 and verse 9, it says, till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Here is a king that actually has power over death itself. There's no king in history. However rich they were, however powerful they were, they all faced one thing. They had all one thing in common, and that is they died. They came, oh yeah, they could create, they could build a big statue, and the statue could, could last, but, but they were gone. Jesus conquers death. He rose from the grave. Luke chapter 6, verse 5, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. You know, this is um, incredible. In one of the commandments, in the Ten Commandments that God gave us, which are really ten promises, beautiful promises about what God wants to do in our lives, the fourth commandment is dealing with the Sabbath, which is the time that God wants to spend with us. Here is a king that actually wants to spend time with his subjects in his kingdom. They're not too unimportant for him. It's not like, you know, if you wanted to meet Alexander the Great or Nebuchadnezzar or Darius, I'm sure there were a lot of people you would have to pass, and only certain people would could really talk with them. Jesus is accessible for everyone. Luke chapter 7, verse 34. The Son of Man, now this was an accusation that they made against Jesus. It says, and it says, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say, look, a gluten and a wine bibber, the friend of tax collectors and sinners. And yet this accusation also contains some very important truth about Jesus, and that it was that he spent time with those that were on the margin. He spent time with those that were the outcasts. He spent time with those people that no one else wanted to spend time with. And then here, John 3, 14, and, uh, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The Son of Man was lifted up, but how was he lifted up? He was lifted up on a cross. But it was through that cross, through his death, that he gained the victory for humanity. I think this will be the last one here, John chapter 5, also about the Son of Man. It says, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. And this says something very important, and that is that the final judgment belongs to Jesus. You see, uh, some people, they were condemned to be killed by Nebuchadnezzar or by other kings of the past. Uh, that was like, that seemed to be the final judgment on their lives. But the Bible tells us that the very final judgment that determines destinies that are eternal, that is only in the hands of none other than Jesus, the Son of Man. So the contrast is great here. The contrast that, that prophecy is creating here and portraying here is incredible to say, okay, you have all these different kingdoms, but then you have another kingdom. And this kingdom is so different, and this kingdom is so inviting. This kingdom is so beautiful, and everyone can be part of it. No one is excluded. Those that can become part of it only have to have faith 
in Jesus, and it's through their faith that they become part of this kingdom, the kingdom of God. You know, there was an interesting story in the Reformation. There were two preachers from England that traveled to Bohemia, which is now the modern-day Czech Republic, and they were preaching their hearts out there, uh, and then they were forbidden to preach. And it was oftentimes uh, back, back in the days that only clergymen could preach, only those that were, you know, um, authorized by either the church or the state. And so these two individuals, they were forbidden to preach. They couldn't share uh, the message of Jesus. They, they, they believed in the Reformation, and so they were teaching from the Scriptures, and, but they were, they, they, they were forbidden. And so what they did is they went to the marketplace, and not only were they both uh, art, uh, uh, preachers, but they were also artists. And so one of them painted the Pope in all his pomp and power and display, uh, and then the other painted Jesus riding on his donkey into Jerusalem. <laughs> and like we say in English, you know, a picture speaks a thousand words. <laughs> and so as people would walk by, the message was very clear. Something's gone wrong. And, and I think that even though we're living in 2022, we can say that still something is wrong in Christianity. Something's not right. Something doesn't sit well. I mean, when you look at Christianity as a whole, whether it is traditional Christianity or philosophical Christianity or business uh, Christianity or whatever kind of term you want to add to what Christianity has become, it doesn't, it's not what it was at one point. And so what we need to do is, again, go back. Go back to this book. Go back to the actual accounts. Remember that the Gospels are just people that were with Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the four Gospels that you have in the New Testament. They are accounts of people that walked with Jesus, that spoke with Jesus, that watched Jesus, and they just wrote down what they experienced. And then that was given on to others, which told others, which told others, and then there was this authentic, beautiful, grassroots movement that rose up, that helped the poor, that fed the poor, that fed the home, the, 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 those that had no food, that, that, that were there for each other, teaching these incredible things about how life can be lived at its best, how we can flourish spiritually and physically and mentally. And this was just an incredible movement that started just spreading like wildfire. And then the Romans got so concerned because they looked at this movement and they didn't know how to stop it, you know? And so they started like, 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 like torturing these Christians and throwing them to the lions and, and killing them in the Colosseum. And, but it didn't stop, the movement just started that just continued. And there was one historian, and he wrote that, uh, he wrote it this way. He said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the gospel. It seems like the more you kill, the more springs up. And so what are we going to do with this? And, you know, it's almost like, you know, we talked yesterday about the battle that is going on behind the scenes, you know, where you have Satan and Christ and this battle. Of course, there was a lot going on in this history. Satan was trying to crush out the movement by outer persecution of the Roman Empire, and it didn't work and so he went to plan B, and plan B was very successful. And plan B was, okay, if I can't crush them from without, I'll join them from within. And that's where we have the time of Constantine and the decline of Christianity, because now suddenly all of these traditions, man-made religion is coming in and is mixed together with the teachings of Jesus. And then suddenly all kinds of weird stuff happen in the name of Jesus. Look at the Crusades. In the name of Jesus, people move from one country to another country, and kill thousands of people in the name of Jesus. And then we have, we have all of these people that during the centuries of, of papal power were burnt at the stake for believing differently, for owning a translation of the Bible, for, for not participating in mass. You would lose your life. This is often a forgotten history, but there are millions. More people lost their lives in those centuries than even in the Second World War. Why? Because they, had, they, 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 they believed in the freedom of conscience. And, uh, and, and, and it was oppressed. There was an oppression going on during this period. And yet God at the same time was calling people back to himself and back to the Scriptures. Now, we're going to make a little transition here, and now I'm going to bring you to the book of Revelation. And we've laid the groundwork here tonight to understand now a prophecy that we find in Revelation. And I mentioned it before, I'm going to mention it again. The books of Daniel and Revelation are twin books. So they need to be studied together. Daniel lived about 500 years before Christ. John, that wrote the book of Revelation, lived in the first century. So they are 500 years separated in time. And yet the concepts and imagery and phrases and, and prophecies are interlinked with each other. And so when you study the book of Daniel, what do we find out? Well, we have this prophecy about all these different kingdoms that are coming, and we have all these explanations and, and descriptions of beasts. And then we come to Revelation chapter 13, 
and John is on the island of Patmos. He was, he was actually sent to the island of Patmos because they wanted to get rid of him, and it was here that he received this incredible prophecy, this incredible vision in Revelation chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. Look at what it says. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea, and look, listen to the description of it. Now, the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were, the feet, well, the, his feet were like the feet of a bear, um, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Now, do you see a connection with the imagery here? Where, where, where did we read about that imagery? It was somewhere back in Daniel chapter... Now, you've got to answer me right, otherwise I have to start the presentation over again. <laughs> Daniel chapter 7, right? Good, very good. So in Daniel chapter 7, we had right, the lion, the bear, the leopard, the dragon-like beast. And then here in Revelation chapter 13, John is looking back... And he's describing this amalgamation of all the beasts of Daniel 7 in one beast that is coming up out of the sea. And what Revelation is going to do and what John is doing here is he's going to continue where Daniel left off. He's going to continue. Remember the principle of repetition and enlargement. This is the principle. He's, he's repeating and he's going to enlarge upon that power of the Antichrist and what the Antichrist is going to do, not only in a historical setting, even though he'll cover that as well, but also in a future setting in our world today. Shall we end here, or do you want to go a little bit further? Okay, a little bit further. Okay, okay, good. Let's look at what happens here in Revelation chapter 13, okay? Revelation chapter 13, verse 7, it says, I also, I, I saw also, uh, I was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. So just like in Daniel chapter 7, the little horn made war against the saints, so this power in Revelation 13 does the same. In chapter 7, verse 21, it says, I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Now, look at what else it says here in Revelation chapter 13. Very interestingly, there was given to him, to this Antichrist power, authority to act for 42 months. So we have a time period that is given to this power. Now, in Bible prophecy, one prophetic day uh, equals one literal year. So when you're looking at prophetic time, and these are in the apocalyptic books of the Bible, so the book of Daniel and book of Revelation, you will find very quickly, and this matches with all the prophecies that we find there, that a prophetic day is equaling one literal year. And some people, many people have actually asked me, why is that? And I can at least tell you two reasons that I believe why that is. Why is it at all that symbols are used in prophecy? Why is it that we have to decode this kind of time phrases, you know, time periods? Well, one reason is because if Daniel and John would have written straight out plainly what they had seen in just plain language, then I can assure you that these books would not have been with us today. <laughs> they would have been destroyed for a long time ago. So in order to protect the language, that was written in, in, in codes and symbols and such in order for it to be, to be safeguarded so that we can have access to it. Because remember, they're talking about the powers that they were under. And so if they had just spoken out plainly, the, the writings would have been destroyed. And another reason, I believe, is that God is asking us to study his word and to compare these scriptures in order to give us these revelations. You know, when gold is most appreciated, when you dig for it and not when it just drops into your lap, right? And so we need to do some digging. And, uh, and it's not that hard because by comparing Scripture with Scripture, um, we have an understanding of these prophecies. Now, even this principle of um, a prophetic day being an equal year, you can find in the, in the Bible in Ezekiel 4, verse 6, and Numbers 14, 34. Now, look at the period now. If we have 1,200 or 42 prophetic months it was talking about, in the Bible, a prophetic month is 30 days, so you know, it doesn't have this distinction of 30 and 31 as we have, which makes it easier. So you take 30 times 42, you have a period of 1260. So 42 months would be 1260 days, but if we then use the prophetic key of a prophetic day for a literal year, we would have 1260 years. Now, this is fascinating. This is exactly the time that the papacy during the Dark Ages was ruling with military support and the state which was backing it up. It's, so, because a church can say whatever it wants and you can decide whether you want to follow or not, but it's different when the church and the state are united. 
when the military power of the state is now backing the dogmas and doctrines of the church. And this happened for a period in history of 1260 years, or what the Bible says, 42 prophetic months. Now, uh, here from history it says, Fagilius ascended the papal chair in 538 under the military protection of Belzeria. So the difference was that now there was a pope that had military support. Now, for a period of 1260 years, there was an oppression going on, and millions of people lost their lives for thinking differently and expressing different views than the papal church, than the Roman Catholic Church. Now, things like this, the church, this was the kind of power that the church had during that time. The church may, be, may, may by divine rights confiscate the property of heretics, imprison their persons, and condemn them to the flames. The right to inflict the severest penalties, even death, belongs to the church. There is no graver, graver offense than heresy. Therefore, it must be rooted out. And what is heresy? Heresy is believing different than the established teachings of the church. And so Rome is saying, if you believe differently, there is no limit to what we can do to you. And this is happening for centuries during, that's why they're called the dark ages. Why are they the dark ages? Well, they're dark because the light is not present. The Word of God is a light, amen? It's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And when you remove the light, well, what do you have left? You have darkness. It says that the church, the Roman Catholic Church, has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. Oftentimes, this is a history that uh, has been swept aside or not so much focused on, uh, but the reality is that when we do some research, we will find that the things, the atrocities that happened during these dark ages uh, were, were tremendous, they were great, and they have an impact upon the world even today. Martin Luther said the following, he said, already I feel great liberty in my heart, for at last I know that the Pope is Antichrist and that his throne is that of Satan himself. Now remember that Martin Luther was himself a Catholic monk. So he's not like kind of just pointing fingers here. He was a Catholic monk. He was, he was actually very dedicated to that task. But he lived in constant fear of God. Not the right kind of fear. I mean, he was afraid of God. And so therefore, he started, and, and then when, he, when someone counseled him to read the Bible, to read the scriptures, he was like, he, he didn't even believe that, that he, he believed that that was unsafe, that he should just stick to the dogmas of the church. But, but it was so difficult, and he has, and went through so much mental anguish that one day he actually you know, went to one of these churches where the, the Bible was actually chained. You, you know, no, most people didn't have a Bible, but there was a Bible that was chained to a wall, and he started just reading the Gospels, and he had such a powerful experience that set him free. And that's what the Gospel does. It sets us free from the entrapments of this world and the false reality of the false pictures of God that we are bombarded with. Now, Revelation chapter 13, 3, take notice of what it says. It says, I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain. And when we come to the end of these 42 prophetic months, or the end of this 1260 years, uh, what took place is the following. We can read it here in church history. It says, the murder of a Frenchman in Rome in 1798 gave the French an excuse for occupying the eternal city and putting an end to the papal temporal power. The aged pontiff himself was carried off into exile to Valence. The enemies of the church rejoiced. The last pope, they declared, had resigned. Now, this happened under uh, Napoleon, which sent in his commander, Berchet. In 1798, he made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government, and established a secular one. So after 1260 years of reign, when all these kings of Europe gave their authority to the pope, to the papacy, in 1798, it came to an end when France abolished this unity of church and state. Now, so far we've been looking at a lot of history, right? But, but Revelation 13 has a couple of indications as to how this is gonna develop currently and in the future. Revelation 13 verse 3 says that his fatal wound was healed. Now that's a very interesting language. So this power would get a fatal wound. 1798, he lost his power, 
But then the Bible predicts in Revelation chapter 13 that he will regain his power. And of course, the simple question is, has the papal papacy, the papal church, the Vatican, regained power in your lifetime? And some of us here are older than others, but I can assure you that however old you are in this audience tonight uh, or watching this, um, I will assure you that in your lifetime, there have been significant changes here where the, the, the papacy has, has, has given, been given a place on the world stage that no other church has ever had or will have. And uh, it was only a couple of years ago, I think it was 2015, that the, that the Pope himself spoke to, in, to, the, to the Senate in America, which is incredible to think about, and a, a Protestant nation inviting the Pope to speak for them. You know, he has uh, very recently, uh, Zelensky, the president of um, Ukraine, uh, asked um, the, the, the papacy to mediate uh, in this war now that is taking place. Like, the, the, the significant power of the papacy um, is, cannot be underestimated. It's incredible to see what is happening. Now, Revelation 13 and verse 3 predicts the following. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So there will come a time that this power will be so exalted on the world stage that, 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 that people will just flock to it and they will see this as, as the, the redeemer of, of, of the world because the world is in a mess and the world is going through all these problems and, and maybe we just need to come back to God. Maybe we just need to come back to some kind of form of morality at least. And, and, and which moral figure can we turn our attention to? Which moral figure can unite all the, the world together? Which moral figure can unite all the religions together? Well, prophecy predicts that it will be this power, the papacy, that will take an active role in this. And it's very interesting because when we look at these, when we look at these uh, developments, we can also hear the appeal of Scripture, because the appeal of Scripture is to, to not look at a man-made institution for your salvation. Uh, the appeal of Scripture is for you to go directly to the Bible and directly to the person Jesus Christ. And so what we're doing here tonight as we're exposing this system from a biblical perspective, at the same time, there's this appeal to return to the authentic message of Jesus. You know, um, Martin Luther said the following, and I think this is a very important statement in the context of what we are studying tonight. He said, I am more afraid of my own heart than of the Pope and all his cardinals. I have within me the great Pope, and he's called self. <laughs> so, so yes, it is important to let the scriptures reveal to us this system, but we shouldn't fall into the temptation of merely pointing the figure and say, yep, yep, that's the Antichrist over there, I'm doing fine. You know, the, the, the concepts of self-exaltation and the concepts of deception and self-deception are rooted all in our human nature, and it is only by a power external to ourselves, the power of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, that we can be set free from that. Amen? Can I get an amen? Yes. So, yes, be aware of not just pointing the finger, but rather looking at how you can build your life on the teachings of Jesus. Now, we're going we're gonna to close with this. So just a few uh, more moments here, and then we're going to close out for tonight. In the book of Revelation, if you would summarize the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, you could actually summarize it with a question. And the question would be the following. Who will you worship? That's really what it all boils down to. Who are you going to worship? And there's this contrast in the book of Revelation between the true Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the coming King, and then you have this counterfeit earthly system, the Antichrist, this beast in Revelation 13. And there's this whole time, this, 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 this question that, that, that just begs to get asked when you go through these prophecies. Is who, who are you going to worship? Because the beast is a counterfeit of Jesus. What the beast does and really what Satan is doing through the beast, because it's really, you know, the enemy, the arch enemy, the fallen angel Lucifer that is working through this earthly system, what he's trying to do is to not only attack the teachings and the life of Jesus, but also uh, create a counterfeit in the place of Jesus. And when you look at Revelation chapter 13, you can see, let's see if we can get the next slide, or otherwise I'll just have to yeah. Uh, when you look at Revelation chapter 13, you see this counterfeit motif that is taking place. You know, Jesus gets baptized in the beginning of his earthly ministry. And then what happens next in Revelation chapter 13, when you read the chapter, the beast comes up out of the water when he starts his, his agenda, his plan. 
Uh, then you look at how long did Jesus minister for? In the, in the Gospels, it tells us that his ministry lasted for three and a half years. That would be 42 months, 1,260 days. Uh, and this beast, it tells us that he also rule, would rule for 1,260 days. Of course, we're looking at prophetic time there, but the, 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 the imagery is there. The phrases are there to show us this is counterfeit power. Well, at the end of those 1,260 uh, days, what happened to Jesus? He received a deadly wound. He died on the cross. What would happen to this beast after the 42 prophetic months, after all of that time? He would receive a deadly wound, it says. What happened to Jesus' deadly wound? Well, he was raised on the first day of the week. He resurrected. That deadly wound was healed. And what happened to the deadly wound of the beast? Well, it says it was also healed. Jesus, when he rose from the grave, People worshipped him and followed him. What do people do when, when this power's beastly wound is healed? Well, people follow him and worship him. So it's so incredible to look at the imagery and the language. It's just, it's just saying again and again to us, like, like, choose for the truth and don't follow the counterfeit. Choose what is real and not the counterfeit. Okay, we'll just do the rest of the presentation here without the slides, but we're just gonna close with one last story in the Gospels, and then, and then we'll, um, we'll close for tonight. In the book of Matthew, chapter 22, there's this incredible account where some of the uh, people are coming to Jesus, and they're saying to Jesus, um, uh, Jesus, we have a question for you. And uh, our question, uh, the question that they had was not a question that was, uh, that they were seeking for uh, an answer. They were really actually trying to get Jesus to say something that they could use against him, that they can accuse him. Uh, and so their question to Jesus is this question like, uh, should we pay tax to, uh, to Caesar or not? And uh, they thought they would really get him into trouble by asking this question because if Jesus would say, you know, um, you don't need to pay taxes, well, then they could accuse him before the Romans and get him in trouble. But if he said, yeah, pay taxes, then they could go to the Jews, which were under the bondage of the Romans, and they could accuse him before the Jewish leaders, like a friend of Rome here. And so it was a designed question to get Jesus to, to say something they could use against him. And Jesus' answer is remarkable. Jesus, he says to them the following. You can, you can read this later in, in Matthew chapter 22. He says, uh, give me a denarius. And the denarius was like the coin of those days. And so someone comes up to him with a denarius. And you can just see all the people are gathering in to see what Jesus is now going to do. And he holds up the coin. And I can, I can imagine in my mind's eye that he's pointing to the coin. And, and he asks this question. He says, whose image is this? Whose image is this? And, and they all answer correctly, it's Caesar. Just like, you know, we have coins today with the image of the ruling power on the coin, just like in that time. So it's, it's Caesar. And then, and then Jesus says this, he says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. Now in that answer, he's really revealing the gospel message. Yeah, you know, Jesus didn't come to say that you don't need to pay taxes. You know, if, if they want to pay, pay what they want to pay, but there's something more important than paying tax in life. Usually people say amen at that point. There's something more important than paying taxes in life. You know, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but give to God what is God's. Because you know what? Uh, if it has the image of Caesar on it, yeah, give it to Caesar, but, but there's something more important. Give to God what belongs to God. Is there something, let, me, let us close with this question, is there something that has God's image on it? Yeah, God's image is placed on human beings. In the very beginning, the very first thing that we read in Genesis chapter one, after God created everything very beautifully and on the sixth day he created human beings and it says he created them in his image. In the image of God, in the likeness of God, we were created. You are of inestimable value in the eyes of God because God created you in His image. And because you are created in His image, guess what? You belong to Him. Amen? So give yourself to him. Don't give yourself to any human organization. Don't give yourself to any, to any um, uh, other teaching than the very teaching of Jesus. This is the invitation. Now, you saw the slides? <laughs> We've come to the end. There it is. There's the question, right? Whose image and description of this? And you can go to the very next, the last slide there. It says, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. That's the invitation tonight, my friends. Give yourself to God. You belong to him. You are made in his image.
We're gonna have a we're gonna have a song again, and as you listen to the song, um, also feel free to. Um, fill out the little card that you have. If you didn't fill it out yesterday, we would love for you to fill out the card. We'll listen to a song, and then I'll come back shortly, and we'll close with a word of prayer. Thank you very much.
Ja, det er en budskap i sang, og uh, vi uh, er veldig... Ja, nå snakker jeg på norsk. <laughs> I could speak Norwegian, but I think it'll be easier in English. <laughs> When you listen to a song in the language, you, your mind becomes that language, right? All right, let's pray together, and then we'll give the word to, uh, to Per Aril. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this song. Thank you so much for this evening that we've been able to spend together in your word. Thank you so much, Lord, for the great and precious promises that are contained in the gospel. And thank you, Lord, that when you expose evil, you also exalt the light. And we thank you, Lord, that we have been able to partake of these precious promises that we've been able to study prophecy together. And I pray for each and every single person that has been here Uh, and that we'll wait, watch this later online, I pray, Lord, that you will speak into our lives uh, the beauty of the gospel and remind us that we belong to you, that we can give ourselves to you because we are made in your image. So thank you so much for these blessings, and I pray that you will be with us the, re the rest of this evening and that you'll bring us back together tomorrow night as we continue our series. For this we ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so tomorrow night, uh, if we can get the next slide up, I'm not sure if this one is still out of function. If you can get the next slide, um, we'll just uh, have the title of our next presentation on there. Um, and if we don't get the slide, I'll just mention it. Our, our next presentation tomorrow night, uh, yeah, there we have it. The title is Life, Death, and the Future. And we're going to look at this question that many people have. What happens when a person dies? The Bible has some incredible answers, uh, and we're going to look at the future prophetic picture that it gives us of what we can expect, and yeah, I just hope that you will come back for that. I look forward to, uh, to study this together with you. So thank you for this evening, and let's uh, meet together again tomorrow evening at 7. Thank you. Mange tak til, uh, til Daniel. Og øh, som sagt, så er det et møde igen i morgen aften. Det er sådan, at alle, som er til stede her nu, har vi lovet, at øh, I får en, øh, en boggave for hver aften. Og i aften, så er den bog, der hedder Jesu Liv. Og den handler om den sande Jesus. Ikke den falske, som Daniel han, øh, har præsenteret her i aften. Men den sande Jesus. Og hvordan han altså, fantastisk øh, hjalp mennesker. Og den historiske skildring af Jesus her, den får I. Så sørg for at få den med, når I går derude. Um, og jeg vil gerne også invitere jer som en ekstra bonus, hvis I kunne tænke jer i morgen. Øhm, så holder Daniel også øh, et par ekstra møder. Øh, ikke her, men øh, kl. 11.15 i Adventistkirken København, som ligger på Frederiksberg på Suomisvej 5. Så hvis I kunne tænke jer at høre Daniel et par ekstra gange, så er han der nemlig øh, og, øh, og holder et møde der 11.15. Og øh, vi spiser også sammen. Så hvis I kunne tænke jer at spise sammen med os, så, øh, så gør vi også det bagefter. Og så holder han også et møde kl. 2 cirka, også på Zoom i Svej. Og ellers er det selvfølgelig så i morgen aften kl. 19, da han fortsætter den her serie. Så tak for i aften, og øh, kom godt hjem og husk jeres øh, gave.